she was just trying to avoid avoid hearing bad things about you, maybe. <laughs> um, <Yes>. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, let's better know a president. Um, this is kind of, we're a little bit out of sync with time because I did the civil rights all the time. But we're going to take a step back slightly and do John Kerry. We uh, want to so, as a new letter, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, we're okay. BB. <laughs> sure, BB. All right, so JFK. JFK was president from uh, 61 to 63, um, which if you are counting is not very long, right? He's one of our shortest term presidents ever um, because obviously he gets assassinated. Um, prior to being a president, he was a Senator from Massachusetts. Prior to bringing that, he was a war hero in World War II. Um, he was born wealthy um, his family actually made money illegally selling alcohol in the 20s. Yeah, they were bootleggers in the 20s. Um, and um, he is generally regarded pretty well. Um, in fact, old people will oftentimes cite him as like one of the greatest presidents of all time, like baby boomers and stuff. Like my parents' generation, they all think that he's like, you know, God. Right, they all think that he's like one of the best. They will frequently rank him as like top five. Most historians of other generations don't rank him that high, um, largely because he just wasn't president very long. He was only president for like two years, you know? So that's not that long. Um, but he does represent something different, okay? Um, Eisenhower before him was old. Uh, before Eisenhower, we had Truman and he was old. And before Truman, we had Roosevelt and he was old. Yeah, you see a, a theme here, right? Um, before then we had Hoover and he was terrible. And then before then we had Calvin Coolidge and he was just kind of boring, right? Like most of our presidents for the last, up until this point, for the last like 30 years prior, right? We haven't had like a young energetic president since Teddy Roosevelt, right? So it's been like 60 years since we've had a young good looking president and boy, does the country go crazy for Kennedy. Right, he gets elected largely because he is one sexy beast, um, and he is he is he's good looking, he's young, he's healthy, right? That he um, his family gets kind of sold as Camelot. You guys know what Camelot is? No, it's like oh, what was it? King Arthur type yeah. story land. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly, exactly that, right? So it's King Arthur. It's like, it's kind of the British mythology version of paradise in a way, right? It's like the perfect city where King Arthur lives and stuff. Anyway, so Kennedy's family gets kind of sold to the U.S. as this Camelot, right? Um, and one of the, you know, one of the big selling points is his wife. His his wife is also young and beautiful, right? And so. Kennedy is the, the second youngest president we've ever had. He's only like 41 when he's elected. He's only like 41 when he's elected, 42, I think, when he's elected, something like that. He's very, very young. And Jackie, his wife, is very, very young and pretty. And the Kennedys are so young that they, in fact, have little kids in the White House. And this is the first time ever <laughs> that the White House is home to children. And the country goes crazy for it. Crazy. Right? They go crazy for the Kennedy kids and the kids are all playing and it's this big deal and, and television is out now so we can show the kids on TV having birthday parties in the White House and Easter egg hunts and Christmas parties and all sorts of stuff, right? And America just falls in love. Oh, so nice, right? Um, they ask, uh, I, I'm kind of making the joke a little bit, right? But they, they ask like, um, people who they vote for, right? And, um, and women overwhelmingly cite uh, the fact that he's young and good looking as the number one reason they vote for him, right? And before you start getting like really hoity-toity about women being shallow, it's like the number three reason men are voting for him too. So, you know, like um, the, the, men aren't, the men aren't as sexually attracted to him as the women are, but... Uh, it doesn't matter. Everyone just loves youth and vigor and you know stuff like that. Okay. Um, there's the story about his election. He's running against Richard Nixon in the election, and his is the first election to be televised. 
okay? Um, and they had the first um, televised presidential debate. So this is in 1960. And um, they go to Hollywood, of course, to film the, to film the debates, because it's like the only place in the country that you know, films television at this time period. And, um, and the Hollywood executives basically go to Nixon, who Nixon was um, Eisenhower's vice president. And Nixon had been like governor of California. Nixon had been, Nixon had like a really long resume. He'd been doing this for quite a while. And um, the Hollywood people go and they tell Nixon and they tell Kennedy and they say, um, you guys, uh, you know politics, but we know, we know TV. Um, you're going to be sitting there. We want to put makeup on you, right? We want to put makeup on you and do hairstyling on you um, because the TV is, you know, you'll look better on TV. And Kennedy says, okay. Kennedy's like, I don't know anything about TV and you guys seem to know what you're doing. So do it. Right. And so you put, they put a bunch of makeup on him, including like blush and stuff. Right. Cause it's a black and white TV. And so, and, and they tell him and they said the, the, the lights are super, super hot. Right. And that the makeup will help clog his pores so he doesn't sweat and stuff. And they said, you'll look better. And so Kennedy's like, all right, I trust you. Nixon on the other end says, I'm not some kind of communist homosexual. I'm not going to do that. And so Nixon doesn't wear any makeup. And then they have the debates and in the debates, Nixon starts to sweat and he looks dead. He looks like a corpse because the lights are like shining directly on his face and it's casting all these like weird shadows on his face and he looks pale like a corpse, you know? And the Hollywood people are all like, dude, we told you this would happen. Like, we know what cameras do to you, you know? And, um, and this kind of changes presidential debates forever. After Kennedy, we will never elect an ugly president again up until 2016, right? But we, we, we go for decades without electing a, an ugly president. We regularly will elect good looking presidents. And it becomes, um, it becomes kind of a prerequisite that not only do you have to be like competent in running the country, but you also have to have like television charisma, right? Like you gotta be able to sell yourself on TV. Um, and that's why like, even though I would say Trump is not a beautiful man, right? Trump does have television charisma, right? Like he knows how to work a crowd. He knows how to work the television. You know what I mean? Um, in a way that's offensive to a lot of people, but, you know, rallies a lot of people, you know? So you have to have that television charisma and JFK is kind of the birthplace of that. Um, Eisenhower is the last bald president we ever have. We won't ever elect a bald person again. Um, I think the problem is probably that bald people are just too sexy to be elected, right? They're they're, they're just too intimidating, they're too sexy, like the country just can't handle it very well. And so that's why we don't elect bald people anymore, right? Um, is it Biden bald? Yeah, Biden is pretty bald. But you're ruining the joke, Sam. You're ruining <laughs> the joke. Ugh. Sorry. What am I even doing here? Yeah, no, Biden is pretty bald, you're right. Because Biden is like, like 980 years old, I think. I don't remember exactly, something like that, yeah something like that yeah but you're right biden is pretty bald <sighs> thanks sam all right <laughs> okay so um kennedy gets elected and the country is swooning we got our birth control now all right so kennedy is going to immediately have right out the gate like within the first couple of months he's going to have his first big failure wah, wah. the baby want to have a new letter um, yeah, let's make a new letter. That's cool. Making the new letter, it's going to be CC for C -C 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 Cuba. CC for C -C Cuba. There you go. All right. So Cuba is the island south of Florida, right? You may remember Cuba from such invasions as the Spanish-American War when we liberated them, kind of. Um, so um, we had taken over Cuba back then, and then we had released Cuba and made Cuba wanted independence and, and we granted independence. So Cuba has been independent at this point for a while. But in the 1950s, this man right here, Fidel Castro, Fidel Castro overthrows the government of Cuba. And he is a c -c -c communist. 
this is in the CC section. So he's a c c communist. All right. So um, Fidel Castro is a communist, and he is um, supported by uh, the Soviet Union. Okay. In case you guys forgot, the Cold War is still going on, right? We spent a while talking about civil rights and a bunch of other stuff. We've kind of neglected the Cold War. Well, it's in full effect, baby. All right, so Americans are freaking out because communist country is right next door. It's only like 40 miles away from Florida. And Florida is where we store all of our old people. So we don't want bad things happening to Florida. And so, um, and so, um, Americans are really freaked out about this. Eisenhower had a planned invasion of, of Cuba to try to overthrow the government, but Eisenhower doesn't carry it out. And Eisenhower rejected the plan actually, because he didn't think it was a very good plan. And Eisenhower was not very eager to get involved in wars that he didn't think he could win right away. He thought that that was like a bad policy. You know, he saw, he, Eisenhower basically believed that if we got into a war, it should be a war that we can win that you shouldn't get into a war, you'll lose. And so Eisenhower rejected the Bay of Pigs invasion. And, um, and so the army and the defense, Department of Defense brings this to Kennedy and Kennedy goes with it. And the army is kind of not totally honest with him, right? And they say, they say, hey, we had this invasion, we're ready to go. Yeah, we wanna go get we want to go get Castro, and um, and Kennedy says, "Okay, uh, is this Eisenhower's plan?" And they said, "Yep, this is the plan that we presented to Eisenhower." And then they left it at that. And so Kennedy goes along with this plan, right? The problem is what Eisenhower rejected this plan because he said this plan was going to fail. Well, it failed. It fails. Yeah, they they didn't exactly lie. This is the plan they presented to Eisenhower. They just left the part where he rejected it all. You know, so um, so it fails. The United States invades. Basically, what ends up happening, we don't need to get into this really, but the United States it we plan to invade really quickly, but we can't because we invaded like the wrong beach and it's too far away from a landing strip for planes and. The local rebels that were supposed to back us up actually turned out not to back us up at all. And they were like in another town over. And so like our guys had to like cross on foot like 30 miles to get to the airstrip, right? And they got caught. It, it was a huge mess. It was basically this huge blunder that Kennedy gets into like just a couple of months into his presidency. Okay, so this is an embarrassment. Um, also, right a couple of months into his presidency, Berlin gets cut in, cut in half with the Berlin Wall. The Soviets erect the wall. Um, let's keep with Cuba, though. I'm going to jump ahead to Cuba. So Kennedy's blunder in the Cuban Missile, or in the um, Bay of Pigs, um, changes things for the Soviet Union, OK? Stalin is dead now, and the Soviets are ruled by a guy named Khrushchev. Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev. Khrushchev is K-R-U-S-C-H-E-V, Khrushchev, okay? And Khrushchev is, you need me to spell it again? K-R-U-S-C-H-E-V, Khrushchev. Um, he's the leader of the Soviet Union, and he's old, he's been a politician forever. He's like in his 60s, later late 60s. And he looks as Kennedy as this young kind of punk kid, right? And he says, look at the Americans. They're such a stupid country. They elected a child, a child who doesn't even know how to invade Cuba. What an idiot, right? And he says, stupid Americans elected a good looking child who doesn't even know how to invade Cuba. And so Khrushchev looks at this and says, I, and he says, now's the time for the Soviet Union to move nuclear weapons into Cuba. They decide to set, set up missiles in Cuba.
Now you have to kind of remember the context here, right? Kennedy bombed the Bay of Pigs. Kennedy is dealing with like freedom ride buses getting bombed by the KKK. He's dealing with riots in Alabama, riots in Georgia, riots in North Carolina. He's dealing with, you know, all of these like civil rights problems. He's dealing with like women's rights groups who are like now protesting because they want the birth control pill. Like Kennedy's dealing with a lot of crap, right? And Kennedy has this, this look where he kind of always kind of Russians think that he's never serious. Russians think that because he's smiling all the time, that he's not a serious man, right? It's the thing, if you ever get to know Russians, the one thing that, the, I know a lot of Russians, I speak Russian, right? I have a lot of Russian friends. And the one thing Russians universally can't stand about Americans is that we smile all the time. They think that smiling all the time is, the like, is a lie, basically. That they think that Americans are basically just lying with their smile that no one is that happy all the time and they hate it. They think it's disingenuous. They think it's like Americans are trying to hide stuff and try to be sneaky and they just are sneaky by smiling, right? That's, that's the way the Russians view it. They, they view that kind of frowning and having no expression is like, is respectful, right? So if they're talking to you and listening to you, they'll just be like, they'll just be like this the whole time as they listen to you and that's them respecting you right where an american says that and we call it rbf right right emma you know rbf you know what that is okay all right so um anyway the soviets move missiles into cuba at which point the whole u.s flips out because the whole u.s says you know they can just drop bombs anywhere they want now and so the U.S. sends uh, American ships to go block the missiles coming in, right? So we send planes over Cuba. These are some of the pictures over Cuba. We send planes over Cuba and we see all the Soviet military stuff that they're bringing in. And we send our ships out there and the ships are basically floating in the water, aiming their guns at each other, loaded with nuclear missiles, and they're ready to fire on each other. We actually get to a point where the admirals are given control of their own um, missiles. And so the admirals can actually nuke each other. And the admirals on the Russian, on the Soviet ship and the admirals on the American ship are like looking at each other and they're deciding whether the other one needs to get destroyed. This is probably the closest the world ever got to destroying ourselves. Okay, this is probably the, the world, like seriously, where the world was something like 15 minutes away from being completely destroyed. There's something that we haven't really talked about. Did we? I don't think we talked about it. It's called Mutually Assured Destruction, MAD, M-A-D, all in caps. I don't, did we talk about it? I don't remember if we did, did we? I don't think so. so. Okay. Now we so I usually present it here. That's why I didn't think we had talked about it. But Mutually assured destruction, um, people will ask, why didn't the Soviet Union and the United States bomb each other? Like, why didn't they do it, right? And the answer is mutually assured destruction. Because if I launch my nuke at you, your nukes will automatically launch at me, right? The Soviets and the United States have all of our nuclear um, missiles on auto launch. So even if the president is like asleep or dead, our missiles will still launch if they detect a Russian one coming in. And so the result is that the Russians are never going to nuke us because doing so kills themselves, right? But we will never nuke them either because by doing so we kill ourselves, right? All of the nuclear powers in the world, the United States, Russia, England, France, and China, they all have mutually assured destruction with each other. Because if any one of them launches a missile, they all launch all of their missiles and the entire world will be dead. This is what's happening here on the water of Cuba. Khrushchev thinks that Kennedy is a young boy who can just get pushed around. 
and Kennedy proves to him that he is not. Kennedy finally calls up Khrushchev on the phone and he says, Khrushchev, I don't want to kill the human race and I don't think you want to either. Let's talk this out, right? And they actually negotiate for like the first time ever. The Soviets back down with their missiles away and take their missiles out of Cuba. And the United States takes their missiles out of Turkey. This is one of the things that people hold Kennedy up for and they say, oh my God, Kennedy saved the world. He saved the world. Any other president would have blown us all up and Kennedy didn't, he saved the world, right? Because he was you know, young and negotiated and he was the kind of guy who could do that. This is like, a lot of people cite this as the evidence that Kennedy you know, is great. What do you think? Do you think other presidents would have gone, would have done the same thing as him? What about Eisenhower? What do you think Eisenhower would have done? I don't think he would have exploded the human race either, because like what you said earlier is like he wouldn't do a war or attack where he knew he would lose type thing. Yeah. Mutually assured destruction is guaranteed loss, right? Maybe, maybe Moscow is blown up, but so is Washington, D.C., right? Like, nobody wins in mutual assured destruction. I don't think Eisenhower would have fought either. I think Eisenhower would have negotiated as well, right? I think he would have. In fact, I think pretty much any American president would have negotiated, right? Just um, mutually assured destruction works because countries aren't crazy. You'll hear this a lot of times where people will say, oh my God, North Korea is crazy, right? You guys have heard that before, I'm sure, right? I'm sure you've heard that a million times. North Korea is crazy, right? Or Iran is crazy. We can't trust them. They're crazy, right? The truth is that North Korea is not crazy. North Korea is 29 million people, right? Countries aren't crazy. Individuals can be crazy, right? Like maybe the leader is a crazy person. A person can be crazy, but a country isn't going to be, right? The Soviet Union is like 200 million people. It's not crazy. And countries want to survive. Sometimes the negotiations gets ratcheted up to the point where we're almost killing the human race, but killing the human race doesn't help anybody we're all just dead then, right? Like, congratulations, you're right, I guess. Like, you proved that you were tough, but we're all dead, so who cares, right? It's like proving to me that you're not scared by driving your motorcycle off a cliff. Okay, cool. <laughs> I guess you're not scared. <laughs> Good for you, right? But well, we can write that onto your tombstone if you want. You know what I mean? Like, it's the same kind of thing. Mutually assured destruction works because countries aren't crazy. And even if you have a crazy person at the very top, you have tons and tons of people below that person who aren't crazy and they don't want to die. So, yeah, that's why I tend to think that Kennedy is not uniquely special in this regard. Um, but, you know, what are you going to do? All right. So, Kennedy then supports Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. And then of course he gets murdered. He gets murdered and LBJ becomes president. Okay, so let's better know, uh, better know Johnson. And then that's probably where we're gonna end because then the next class we'll do Vietnam. We'll do the Vietnam War. We'll do the Vietnam War. And then we'll, I, I said we were gonna do Roe versus Wade today but we need to do the Vietnam War first and then Roe versus Wade. So we are going to do abortion. We just, uh, we'll do it later. All right, so let's do this. LBJ and then we're done. Hey, hey, LBJ. <laughs> Say what? DD. 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 I, I don't have a joke for that. It's just DD. All right, big DD number DD. Yeah, but Kennedy was a Democrat too, so.
Yeah. I don't know. Whatever. PD stands for Lyndon Baines Johnson. Ooh, this is not right. <gasps> my, my Johnson slide is wrong. <gasps> oh, no. I can fix it for you right now. All right, so Johnson, um, before he was a president, he was a senator and a congressman from Texas. Minnesota. What? I thought it was like not supposed to be Missouri, but or Montana. No, from oh, Texas. Texas that's different. <laughs> from Texas. All right, so here's the deal with Johnson. His grade is tricky. His grade is really tricky to come by because he's kind of conflicted. Okay, I'm gonna write conflicted. So, um, his dominant issues are the civil rights movement um, plus uh, Vietnam. Okay, so Johnson, here's the problem with Johnson. Here's the deal. So Johnson becomes president. So Johnson was um, like the master of the Congress, okay? He was considered like the, one of the best, most powerful senators, one of the best, most powerful congressmen. He was like the master of Congress, right? And he was the kind of guy who could like get any law passed. He knew... He knew who to deal with. He knew who to like, you know, bribe and whose hands to shake, and who to go to lunch with and who you like buy, a, buy brandy with and who you can intimidate. Like he knew, he knew how to get stuff done. And Kennedy didn't have a lot of experience. So Kennedy picks like the most experienced guy in Washington, D.C. to be his vice president, right? So, so Johnson can be like the hammer, you know, uh, knocking people's heads when Kennedy needs people's heads knocked. So LBJ becomes president and he is dominated by the civil rights movement in the beginning. LBJ mm -hmm. is from Texas. He did not support the civil rights movement in the very beginning, but he <clears throat> learned and changed to, to support it eventually. Um, and Kennedy changed him. Kennedy changed him in this regard. So he does support the civil rights movement. He does support Martin Luther King. He does get the civil rights bill passed. That's fantastic, great. It's like one of the best things ever, right? He also spends a good deal of his presidency on something called the Great Society. And the Great Society is um, Johnson's attempt to destroy poverty. He's gonna spend a lot of his time trying to pass laws to get rid of poverty to destroy poverty, right? So far sounds great, doesn't it? Like, sounds awesome. The problem is the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War kicks in and the Vietnam War just kind of consumes everything. Americans just start to die in the war all the time. And Johnson doesn't seem to be able to win. Americans are faced with what will become the first loss we've ever had in a war, kind of. This is the first time we've ever lost a war, kind of. And this is gonna just dominate Johnson. By the end of his presidency, people will just be protesting and blasting him and like swearing his name, right? His presidency gets dominated by, by the chant outside of his window at night. Hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? Hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? And that's going to be this chant that haunts him. And it plays in his mind over and over again. Hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? Right? 
the protest movements are going to be immense. By the end of his presidency, the protests are so big and so nasty and so immense. And the war is so brutal that he doesn't even run for office. He's just like, no, I'm done. He just, he's out. He just leaves. Right? Here's the deal. When we look at him in 2020, he's pretty good, right? Civil rights movement, that's fantastic, right? Voting Rights Act, that's fantastic. Women's rights, that's fantastic, right? He, you know, protections for women in the workplace, uh, trying to eradicate poverty, he's gonna get us Medicare, right? Medicare, Medicaid, he's like, those things are really, really good. He does a lot of education reform, right? But he also killed 50,000 Americans in Vietnam and like 2 million Vietnamese in the war. You know what I mean? So this is where his ranking is really kind of, uh, it's, it's tough to give him a B, right? Like I feel like I should give him a B, but I also feel like, you know, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? You know what I mean? It's, it's uh, a point of being conflicted, okay? We're gonna leave that there. Um, we'll do Vietnam next class period and, and uh, you can make a judgment for yourself as to how jacked up Vietnam is, right? How bad is it going to be? Cool? All right, so this is, um, this should be the last of notes three, right? This should be Q3 N3, day four, if I remember right. So I'll post, yeah. So um, you guys can take pictures of your notes and, and submit them and, and I'll grade them. Cool. We start out once, right? No, it should be Malcolm X, I think, was the first one we did here. Malcolm X feels like he should be in the other one, but, you know, if we're keeping four days. Malcolm X is the first, first where it starts. I don't know what number you're on, Sam. Um, oh, wait, here's Nation of Islam. <laughs> 